and Joel in Snyderville, Utah. Hey, Joel, what's on your mind? Uh, hey, how you doing today, Tom? Good. How are you? I'm doing all right. Hey, uh, you, to your point that capital gains should be taxed as regular income, uh, that does have a little bit of merit. The biggest problem with it, though, is that the, there's a number of different laws that would limit us from actually having the applicability to do that. For example, I mean, if, uh, example, hang on, just say, okay. Ronald Reagan set the capital gains rate at the exact same rate as the ordinary income tax rate and famously said that he thought that, you know, bus drivers should not have to pay higher tax rates than millionaires. In fact, let me play for you the, uh, the clip of Ronald Reagan no, saying second, just that. Second paragraph hey, I, of that. I, I, I will give you, the, I, I'll well, give you that. You can, you can rebut Ronald Reagan right after you listen to him. Here he is. Okay. We're going to close the unproductive tax loopholes that have allowed some of the truly wealthy to avoid paying their fair share. In theory, some of those loopholes were understandable, but in practice, they sometimes made it possible for millionaires to pay nothing. But a bus driver was paying 10% of his salary, and that's crazy. Do you think the millionaire ought to pay more in taxes than the bus driver or less? Okay, your turn, Joel. Uh, okay, now, if you would play the rest of that speech where he went on to the next sentence, he talked about across the board tax cuts for everyone while also... Which is what he loopholes. did. Which is what he did. Um, he did across the board tax did, cuts. And, and he did close but some loopholes, the but the, the, the net effect of it was that he, he produced a massive budget deficit. A disastrous budget he deficit. Uh, he which did, is still but with also us. we were trying to outspend the Soviet Union at the same no, time. No, so. no, no, we weren't. Come on. The, it, long before Ronald Reagan became president, and, and presidents before Reagan have acknowledged this, and people from the Reagan administration have acknowledged this, the CIA has been you know, right out front about this forever. All, going all the way back to the 60s, I mean, this was, this was a debate in the Eisenhower administration. Is it possible that the Soviet Union is going to eclipse us? It was, a, it was actually a debate in the 1950s. But by the mid-1960s, by, by the middle or toward the end of the Vietnam War in the early 70s, certainly, the CIA was clearly, obviously, and loudly, at least within the halls of government, on record as saying the Soviet Union is going down in flames. And I can tell you, as somebody who visited Russia, or the Soviet, visited Moscow when it was the USSR, visited East Berlin when it was East Berlin in the 1980s. It was obvious to any idiot who walked in. I mean, I, you know, I, I flew in on Aeroflot, and the, when the plane took off, my seat gave way, and, and the back of the seat fell backwards, and I was staring up a guy's nostrils, you know, who's sitting in the seat behind me. And then, and then when we got to, to, to Moscow... The, you know, they put us up in the Aeroflot airport, which, or, or a hotel, which was the coolest. Now, this, keep in mind, this is one that was the Soviet Union. Um, put us up yeah. in this hotel, and we were on the third floor. The elevator didn't stop at the third floor. It was broken. So, on, you know, when we were going up, we'd go to the fourth floor and take our things down to the third floor through the stairs. And when we were coming out, we'd, we'd walk down to the second floor and take the elevator down. I mean, it was like anybody could have looked at that system and said, this is, go this is not going to stand. And, and Gorbachev was not... You know, I mean, he was a brilliant guy and a great agent of history and whatever, but he also was just a pragmatic realist, and it had nothing to do with Ronald Reagan. It had to do with the fact that this system hadn't really worked since after World War II. The stimulus of World War II helped the Soviet Union tremendously, much as it helped the United States. But once that stimulus was gone, they had an economic system that didn't work. End of my rant. I completely, I completely agree with you there. So Reagan saying that However, he had to spend a trillion dollars to defeat the Soviet Union was silly, and he knew it. Uh, not entirely, because what brought the Soviet Union down was they did not have a large enough, other than the economy, other than their arms industry. The arms industry was what drove the Soviet Empire or the Soviet Union during uh, the latter half of the 20th century up until. And it's what's collapsed. breaking the United States. I did not States. go to the Soviet Union. To a degree, yes. It's one point two trillion dollars a year. Well, we're going over that now, so I'm saying the entitlement industrial. I mean, that's a that's a third of now, our federal budget functionally. But yeah, you know, it's 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 a massive amount of money. But but uh, yeah, I mean, you can you can also make the argument that Afghanistan helped bring down the Soviet Union. Although um, I was talking with Kurt Eichenwald on Friday, and he was like, eh, not quite. You know, it was, it was much more complex than that. Okay, I'll... Well, no, it did, and the biggest reason it did is, uh, I agree with the Afghanistan reason, is because was when we were in our little uh, production slash spending war, we were building bombers, and they were going to set in um, uh, 
hangars, and they were building bombers, and they were getting shot down by uh, Stinger missiles that were made in Israel that we were using sort of a roundabout way to get them to the uh, – uh, the Northern, uh, they were the Northern Alliance before they were the Northern Alliance. I can't right. remember exactly. The Mujahideen what they were called, was the original name, yeah. And yeah. and yeah, that was the group and, and and Joel, but. what this all proves, and and I, you know, I, I, you identified yourself to our call uh, to our uh, our operator as a conservative. What this all proves uh, is no, I, I am a moderate. I am not oh, a okay. conservative. Right. I'm saying there's my apologies. Other. Maybe maybe she assumed. Um, but yeah, it, it, Romney's it, a moron. I'll be the first one to go on the <laughs> okay. and say that. But. What this, but, but my point about the, all this military spending is that what it proves is that if, if World War II, if that, if that massive amount of military spending got us out of the Great Depression, which many conservatives, Republicans will make that argument, if the World War II helped the Soviet Union you know, survive for another decade or two than they would have otherwise because of the stimulus, if... The spending, you know, the, uh, Ronald Reagan's trillion dollars in defense spending during his eight years, um, you know, for Star Wars, which was basically you know, a crony capitalism gig, you know, to give money to his buddies in the in the defense industry. If all those things stimulated the economy, the then, they, novel, which, uh, then they then they completely revolutionized manufacturing. But. If if all those things stimulated the economy, then what they demonstrate is that John Maynard Keynes was right. In the short term, Keynesian economics works. In the long term, the rest of the economy cannot keep up with it. Not true. I challenge everybody listening to uh, read the entire military-industrial complex, the farewell well, address. Well, if you're, if you're only going to talk about that. Yeah, well, Eisenhower, in fact, I've, I've played ch- large chunks of it on this program. If we're talking about military spending, I agree with you. Military spending is the least effective and long-term the, and ineffective form of Keynesian stimulus because when you, when you take a billion dollars and you turn it into a bomb and then you drop it on somebody else, that's a billion dollars that's gone forever. On the other hand, if you take a billion dollars and you use it to build schools and hospitals and roads, it's going to produce economic activity that's going to produce two, three, four, five billion dollars in tax revenues over the next 20 or 30 years. And, so, and that's what John Maynard Keynes was saying, and that's what Barack Obama has been saying for three years, and the Democrats in the House and Senate have been saying, is let us, this is not an expenditure, you know, building our infrastructure, you know, sending our kids to college, uh, the investment in our intellectual in- infrastructure. These are not expenses. These are investments. It's just like, you know, if, if you go out and you buy a bunch of stock, that's not an expense. That's an investment. And, and, and whereas I would say that military expenditures... Outside of the innovation that you correctly point out, you know, a lot of innovations have come out of military spending and have come out of our wars, but I could, I could also argue that arguably more came out of the space program, came out of, you know, let's, uh, John Kennedy's, we're going to send a man to the moon. Ooh, I've got the perfect rebuttal for that. Okay. Uh, mostly government spending, and I work for the large uh, engineering corporation. I've also got my Series 7 license because Utah has something we call industrial banking, which has made a lot of millionaires in this state, but... NASA, for over 20 years, and they spent over $10 billion, tried to create a six-axis hypervelocity water jet to fabricate everything from diapers to fig newtons to metal panels that we use in the aerospace industry. They, the prototype that they released was an absolute failure. Okay. Low Dynamics Incorporated, which is based in Seattle, Washington, which is the company I work for here mm-hmm. in Salt Lake City, which is very large, it took us five years to develop that same technology and $980 million. Yeah. All NASA showed us was how they screwed up. Well, I, you know, I, I am not someone who says that the government should be making our cars or should, you know, I, I think that in the area of, certainly of medicine and pure research, there's an important, you know, National Institutes of Health play an important role funding universities for research that is done, things like that. And I think that large, some large chunks of things that inter, interact with our comments, like hospitals should be not-for-profit. But, uh, yeah, I'm not going to argue free enterprise with you, Joel. Thanks for the call. This is the Tom Hartman Program. My point was just that whether it's NASA or whether it's the military, I guess I was defending NASA to some extent, and I still will, um, that it, it demonstrates Keynesian principles.